This video is sponsored by Surfshark, and before I start, I want to talk about why using their service is a good idea. With the internet rife with sketchy types all eager to get hold of your personal information, a smart move is to protect yourself. There are some basic things you can do, such as not using the same passwords. But hackers are astute at getting this sort of critical info direct from your computer. And the easiest way for them to do that is when you are using a public network, such as at a coffee shop or an airport. I once had a mate of mine who shall remain nameless once hack into my email for fun while sitting next to me. Taught me a valuable lesson about online security. And that's where Surfshark comes in. They are a virtual private network, VPN for short, that keeps your online information safe by encrypting all the data sent between you and the internet. This keeps it safe from both hackers and other nosy parkers who want to get hold of your info. The other advantage of using Surfshark is that you can change which country your connection is routed through. This means that if you are a bit of a traveller and are in a country that censors the internet, for example one of those blocking YouTube, you can use Surfshark to get your dose of forgotten aircraft. So if you want to enjoy secure and unobstructed online browsing and the ability to access your account safely, go to the link in the description. Enter the promo code NASH, all capitals, to get 83% off plus an extra three months for free. Consider that a PSA, and let's get on with the topic at hand. The Fairchild A-10 is an aircraft that enjoys a great reputation, though its official name is Thunderbolt 2. I don't think anyone calls it that. If they are being polite, they call it the Tank Buster. But for the vast majority, it's the Warthog. Utterly distinctive in appearance, the A-10 has carved through enemy forces in a host of campaigns over many decades and apparently will continue to do so for some years still to come. But the Warhog had to win its place in the lineup, and there was another aircraft that was built to compete against it. The Northrop YA-9. So, a bit of history. There was for a long time something of a disconnect between the United States Army and Air Force about the sort of support the latter should provide the former. For close air support, otherwise known as CAS, the Air Force generally relied upon hanging bombs or rockets off existing high-performance fighter aircraft. This proved broadly sufficient during the era of the propeller aircraft and the Second World War, but once the USAF transitioned to jets, CAS was no longer of any great interest to them. Instead, it was all about speed, preferably supersonic. The USAF got really focused on nuclear delivery, and if they were called on for ground pounding duties, they had the F 100 Super Sabre, another fighter converted for ground attack, and the F 105. But these were both designed as supersonic aircraft, and as a result, nothing in the USAF's inventory was particularly suitable for close air support. And this became extremely apparent during the Vietnam War. In 1964, the USAF actually resorted to taking hand-me-down A-1 Sky Raiders from the US Navy. These did sterling work supporting US troops, but the Sky Raider was essentially a Second World War aircraft, and the USAF wanted something better. They were also concerned that the US Army was beginning to experiment with dedicated attack helicopters. An agreement reached in April 1966 between the US Army and Air Force meant that the Army would give up its fixed-wing transport assets mainly C-7 Caribous, and in return the Air Force would not be involved in frontline rotary-winged operations. Naturally, the USAF was then concerned they might lose budget to the Army if the new attack helicopters could do a better job of supporting troops than high-speed aircraft. So a few months after the agreement, in mid-1966, the Air Force commissioned the AX program, intended to develop a new ground-attack aircraft. In sharp contrast to the USAF's usual designs, this was to focus on operating low and slow, right above the treetops, and with the pilot able to loiter in support of forces on the ground. The proposed aircraft would need to have massive firepower and payload abilities, and would need to be well armoured. In 1970, the focus switched from attacking insurgents in jungles to fighting a conventional armoured conflict against the Soviet Union in Germany. The USAF tweaked its requirements and posted a request for proposals that called for what was essentially a modern-day version of the Soviet's World War II Sturmovik, the IL-2. The new aircraft needed to be able to assist in breaking up enemy armoured formations and to be able to provide close air support with a range of ordnance to friendly ground troops as close as possible. 
To do this, the new support plane would only have a maximum speed of 460 miles per hour, that's 740 kilometers per hour, and an external payload of 16,000 pounds, or 7,300 kilos. The new AGM-65 Maverick Fire and Forget missile, then in development, would be the main anti-armor ordnance. But the primary weapon, which the aircraft would be built around, would be a rotary 30mm cannon that would be able to tear up lighter armored vehicles. The USAF expected to purchase 600 of the new attack aircraft and stipulated that the flyaway cost should be no more than $1.4 million, which would be about $9.5 million today in 2021. Six companies entered submissions, but only two, the Fairchild YA-10 and the Northrop YA-9, were awarded development contracts. Northrop built two YA-9A prototypes, these both flying in 1972. In contrast to the A-10, the A-9 had a more conventional appearance. A shoulder-winged monoplane of all-riveted aluminium alloy construction, the A-9 differs from its rival in having its two turbofan engines mounted under the wing roots. These were Lycoming YF-102s, a derivation of the T-55 turboshaft that was used on the US Army's Chinook helicopters. Though these engines produced less power than the TF-34s used on the YA-10s, 7,200 pounds of force versus 9,280 pounds of force, Northrop believed that they potentially offered a substantial price saving for initial purchase and in lifetime costs. And the lower power doesn't seem to have affected the YA-9A's performance. Northrop's test pilots reported that the aircraft handled like a fighter and the two aircraft demonstrated a top speed of 520 miles per hour or 837 kilometers per hour. It also had great maneuverability, principally due to the YA-9s having a large rudder and flaps. This allowed the aircraft to slide sideways without yawing or banking, assisting with weapons aiming. The pilot's view was also very good, as expected for an aircraft designed to operate at low levels. Protection was also substantial. The pilot was ensconced in an armoured bathtub, which on the prototypes was aluminium, but in the production aircraft would have been titanium. The hydraulic flight controls were duplicated, and the wing-mounted fuel tanks were self-sealing and filled with foam to prevent fuel leaks and fires if the aircraft was hit. Ten hard points were mounted under the wings, which could carry the specified 16,000 pounds of ordnance. The cannon, in contrast to the A-10, was mounted under the aircraft's belly and not in the nose, with the muzzle under the cockpit. However, at the time of the AX competition fly-off, the GAU-7 cannon, the chosen weapon, was still in development and as a result both the YA-9s and YA-10s would carry the M61 Vulcan 20mm cannon for testing. On October 10th, 1972, both the YA-9s and YA-10s were handed over to the Air Force for two months of evaluation. I'm guessing the start of this video has given away what happened. In January 1973, the A-10 was declared the winner and Fairchild awarded the production contract. The YA-9As scored well in the testing, with the two prototypes conducting a total of 123 flights and the Air Force stated that the aircraft did meet its requirements. However, the Air Force also stated that the reason for the selection of the A-10 was that Fairchild had conducted a more thorough testing program of their design. They also said that the fact the engines of the A-10 were more developed was an important factor. With that, the two YA-9s were retired, though happily not scrapped. Today, one resides at Edwards Air Force Base in California, awaiting restoration, whilst the other is on display at the Marchfield Air Museum, also in California. There are a couple of other details that we should examine when it comes to the Northrop A-9 before concluding the video. The decision to not choose the A-9 as their new attack aircraft, especially as the USAF admitted the aircraft was perfectly adequate, has led to speculation as to the exact reasoning behind the decision. The fact that the reason given was the greater testing done by Fairchild on the YA-10 is often attributed to the respective states of the two competitors at the time. Northrop was in the process of fielding the first of the F-5E Tigers, an aircraft that would prove a great success but their main development focus was on the new Northrop YF-17 light fighter that was potentially one of the most successful aircraft the company would ever produce. As a result, most of Northrop's efforts, testing, financial and political, were absorbed by the YF-17. In contrast, Fairchild was a company in trouble. 
They had only one defence contract of any great potential in the pipeline, the YA-10. So they threw everything they had at it, including making it known amongst their political supporters that failure to win the AX competition would spell the end of the company. This has led to speculation that it was primarily for this reason that the A-10 won. I would say that more research would have to be conducted to determine the truth of this. But, if the USAF was happy with either aircraft, it would make sense to please those in Congress making noise about the issue as a bonus to getting a good aircraft. The other point is one that has been circling for decades. In 1975, the Soviets flew the Su-25, their own armoured ground attack aircraft. This was built to the same sort of doctrine as the A-9 and A-10, and its similarities to the A-9 has long caused speculation. Did the Soviets rip off Northrop's aircraft? Personally, I think it is largely a case of similar design parameters resulting in similar designs. In fact, the sketches of what became the Su-25 were down on paper in 1968. But development of the prototype Su-25 didn't start until 1972, the same year that pictures of the two AX competitors were appearing in the press. And interestingly, in 1972 and 73, articles appeared in the Soviet military press discussing the A-9 and talking about its manoeuvrability and armour layouts in very favourable terms. So, while I don't think the Su-25 is a rip-off of the A-9, it is entirely possible that it was influenced by it. Thanks for watching, and thanks again to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. Remember to check out the link in the description to get a deal on protecting yourself online.